that are part of the same family, they contain uh, similar or identical devices. Uh, over the last few years, I've been mostly working as a contractor for doing uh, embedded Linux kernel work in upstream for uh, Renesas. So you will uh, see lots of that in my presentation. Uh, currently, my Linux subsystems, uh, for during the last few years, I've been maintainer of the clock and pin control drivers for the Renesas SOC. And since uh, last summer, I uh, took over maintenance of the Renesas ARM SOC platform from uh, Simon Harman, uh, who stepped down. Uh, so the second part is uh, mostly about what you can find under ARC, ARM, Mac, SH Mobile, and some stuff. Uh, device trace under uh, Arch ARM boot DTS and Arch ARM 64 boot DTS Renesas, and of course some uh, platform drivers on the drivers SOC Renesas. Uh, last year I became Lin LTSI sub maintainer. LTSI is the long term support initiative which aims to provide a stable kernel for devices that has to have to run for more than 10 years. It looks like this year there won't be a LTSI release, which means, which is good for me because it means less work because I'm busy all the time. And due to the Amiga legacy, I'm also maintainer of the M68K architecture, uh, but that's not so relevant for this presentation today. So first, what is matching? So you have here this shiny new, new hardware, and of course you want to run Linux on it. That means that your drivers need to support it. So the matching part is finding a suitable driver for the piece of hardware that you have in your nice, shiny device. Of course, you want to identify all capabilities that are present and make use of them. And there's also a negative part. You have to handle all things that are not working properly or are not supported or that are limited in this specific version of the hardware you're using. So let's have a look at uh, how Linux traditionally handled matching. So a long time ago, there was Linux on the PC, and you could configure your kernel. It didn't use kconfig, but these old batch scripts, uh, bash scripts. And your kernel configuration was tailored to your specific machine, which is, of course, not that scalable if you want to, to run it on lots of machines. Fortunately, on a PC at that time, most devices on the ISA bus were located at specific uh, well-known addresses. So you could do some probing. Is it really present? That's it. <coughs> Linux was also ported to other architectures. And those were, unlike PC platforms, rather heterogeneous. So on M68K, you had Amigas, Ataris, Macintoshes, and Trees, similar with MIPS and Spark. There were lots of different variants. So most of these uh, ports cared more about multi-platform than Linux on the PC. And typically, there was some machine type that you could check to see what kind of machine you were actually running on, and then the drivers could check that and see whether a driver should be enabled or not. Uh, there was a boot info that was passed from the bootloader to the kernel or from ID prom or various things like that. Then we had the rise of the discoverable buses. So PCs moved from ISA to PCI, which was auto-probable. So you could easily find out what a hardware exactly was present on your device. It was similar on other platforms like the Amiga and the Macintosh, Spark, other, in other architectures. They all had probable modern buses where you could easily find out what's running. So it sounds easy to find a driver that matches that. And most of those buses provide a find API, which means that you can call some routine to find a specific device with some specific ID, or you could loop over all devices and check the IDs and see whether this device was of interest to a specific driver. Um, you can have also multiple instances of the same device and things like that. And to prevent, make sure that no two drivers were trying to talk to the same device, some form of resource management was introduced so a driver could mark a device as in use. Then in 2001, Linux got a device framework, which was mostly triggered by hot pluggable buses like USB. So unlike the traditional buses, it means that the device could appear anytime in the system you insert your USB camera and suddenly there's a new device and the driver should 
start using it. If you unplug it, then the driver should stop using it again. So the device framework provides a separation from the bus, which scans for the devices, and creates a, a struct device. And then you also have the third component is the driver that matches against the device. So for the PCI bus, you have PCI devices and drivers, other buses as well. Platform devices and drivers are a bit special because this, these are usually present on a non-probable bus, which means that uh, some platform code has to create a platform device with a specific name, and then the driver matches against that name. An important difference with before is that now the driver core matches the devices to the drivers based on IDs, and it calls a, a match function that is provided by a specific bus. So first, the bus scans the devices, scans for present devices, creates struct devices from them, and then the de device driver core will loop over all the drivers and tries to match them with the device by calling the match function. On the embedded side, we unfortunately, we had the return of the non-discoverable buses. So in a, SLC, a system on chip, you have a CPU core and you have lots of devices and people didn't bother having a, a PCI bus inside SOC because well, you have SOC, you know what SOC it is, so you know what's there. So it means that now Linux needed to know what was inside SOC and what kind of devices were. So you had a big growth there of different new SOCs with all different or not so different devices, small changes. Those SOCs are typically mounted on a board. On the board, you have other components. Those were typically standard and could be similar like on other devices. But for both of that, you need a hardware description. So in embedded, in ARM, they mostly went with platform devices and platform data. So you have a board file which just creates lots of platform devices, each one for each device present on the, the SOC and on the board, and some platform data to configure that and uh, yeah, that led to uh, Linus' famous rant from 2010 about the big ARM chunk, churn, because you had all those board files that were being updated and enhanced and changed, and uh, all the platform data we had to change when the driver changed, and uh, each and every board usually provided its own dev config, and there was lots of uh, churn, that, as he called it, and as he saw it in the Arch ARM uh, sub-architecture. And that eventually led to uh, the creation of the ARM SOC team and also the use of device tree. So what's a device tree? Uh, device tree is basically a hardware description of a device. Uh, it initially started with the real open firmware that maybe some people still remember. It was first used on, uh, by Sun on uh, Spark stations, and then later also used on PowerPC, like the Power Mac and the Common Hardware Reference Platform. It was some firmware that provided a hardware description of uh, the device to a host operating system. And it also provided services that you could go back into. A different thing is the flattened device tree, which is basically just a hardware, abstract, a hardware description without the uh, service callbacks. And in a device tree, every device is represented by a device node. And every device node has several properties. And one of them, the most important one, is the compatible, value, compatible property, which is a list of names of devices, names of uh, kinds of devices it's compatible with. And there are also properties for uh, resources like uh, uh, which addresses on the bus are uh, used by the device, uh, what interrupts it uses. Can be custom properties specific to the device. P handles, also very important. Uh, they are basically pointers to other devices. They're used uh, when describing interrupts or when a, a device has a GPIO to be enabled, then there needs to be a reference to which to the GPI contour. Uh, that this GPIO is connected to. The device can also have subnodes. Uh, for example, if you have a, a SPI controller, there can be multiple SPI slaves on the bus, then you have subnodes for each of them. And the most important part is that the device tree provided a clear separation between the hardware description and uh, 
the OS, OS configuration. So the, the device tree has the hardware description and then the OS uh, can just receive the hardware description and based on that uh, configure, uh, create all the, 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 launch all the drivers and instantiate the devices in, uh, in the OS and provide the, yeah. Because there's a clear separation, it also means that uh, the DT API is really a stable ABI. So uh, you cannot just change the device tree afterward, the, the meaning of the device tree afterward. So there are stable bindings. And we have to care about backwards compatibility if you try to do that. Because people, they may want to use all device tree and run it on a new kernel. So if you have changed uh, the bindings, uh, then you have to take care of that. On the Linux OS side, the device tree uh, tied into the platform devices, which means that for each device that you have in your device tree, Linux will create a platform device and then with references to all the properties and, and all the rest, the other information you have. So in 2010, ARM started using the flattened device tree. Uh, many of the early bindings were basically straight conversions from platform devices with platform da data to DD properties. What does this mean? So platform data, it was just a structure which contained additional parameters to pass to the device. And a simple and naive way to create DT bindings would be to just convert the structure to a set of properties in DT. So you can have the same compatible value, many feature properties, and describe all detail in DT. Unfortunately, that's not such a good idea. And later, uh, people changed that, but I'll say more about that in the, the next slide. Uh, one other thing that people did in the early days was the co for the common clock framework, all the clocks were explicitly described in DT. So people tried to have to convert a monolithic clock controller on the device into multiple device nodes, like a fixed rate, rate clock here and a fixed rate clock there, and then a clock with a divider, and then some special bits that are non-standard and have a sp only a sp compatible value for that. But this turned out also to be not such a good idea. Because if you put too much description in the DT, that means that if you make a mistake or you misread a data sheet or the data sheet was updated later because there was a bug in it that your device tree has to change but you have the stable DT API. So one big issue with uh, using lots of feature properties is that you probably will forget to describe a difference there and due to the stable DT API it's not so simple to fix it later. So for example, you have a new SLC, which is very similar to an another one that's already su supported. And it has this IP block, which is very similar to the, pre to the previous generation. Only there's a different pre-divider. Oh, then we can just make it compatible with the other one and add a new DT property to specify the different pre-divider. The advantage of this is that if the SLC vendor comes up with an another new SLC, and they use a different pre-divider. Oh, we already have a property for that, so we can just change it and it's supported directly. The big issue is, what if another difference is discovered later? Then you end up with two devices with the same compatible value and, and you have to add more properties. And what do you do with backwards compatibility? So DT evolved. And we started using more different compatible values and fewer or no feature properties at all. Uh, another big difference is that in the clocks we went from from this uh, description of lots of clocks to one monolithic device node with a specific compatible value for each on SOC clock generator because all of this is much easier to extend and maintain. Interestingly, I gave a presentation about uh, device tree best practices as ELC, oh, it should be ELC, not ELC, in 2014. And I uh, went over it and I was wondering, is this the advice I gave in there still good? And it turned out that it actually was. 
most of what I told there is still valid and uh, is still good advice for modern, for de uh, designing modern device bindings. One big difference is uh, clocks. At that time, we still, the best practice was still considered to be describing all the clocks explicitly in DT, while now we prefer to use a monolithic approach. There was were at that time also some mentions of uh, using device tree without the common clock framework, but that's completely dead from the point of view of Linux, so we don't have to care about that. Other differences compared to five years ago is that uh, for power domains, we handle them similarly like clocks, except at that time there were no bindings for DD for power domains yet, so that was not such a big of an issue at that time. And yeah, of course, there are diff other differences for new bindings that were introduced much later, like uh, ARM idle states and things like that, which is something we didn't have in DT at the time. A more recent way to match devices is uh, using SOC device match. This is something that was introduced three years ago by Arne Bergman. So basically it boils down to that in many cases we want to, yeah, to check some specific uh, revision of a SOC we're running on because there's a bug in an early revision of the hardware or you want to check a serial number or a specific machine name and in that case, a platform code can provide a SOC device. And then by calling SOC device match, drivers can match against any of the listed attributes there. Um, they can omit attributes and they can use wild cards, which makes it a very powerful feature. So you can really match against uh, uh, ES1 dot asterisk or something like that if all one dot something revisions of uh, SOC are affected. But this is something that uh, you should only use in, well, when all else fails and you have no other way to, to match your drivers. So that was a quick history. Now to get uh, to the actual matching of the drivers against devices. First you had need to have something to match against. And on embedded ARM, this is mostly about device trees. So if you want to match against a device, you need to have good DT bindings that take into account all the features of the device. So originally, the basic idea was that uh, the compatible value in a device node specifies, can sp have multiple values. And so you can specify the most specific name for the component to the least specific name and then the driver will match against whatever is supported. Originally this was to devised to be the current version of the IP core you have plus some older compatible version. So like uh, if you have a, a driver for an already existing IP core and then the SOC vendor enhances this IP core to add some additional features, it may still be compatible from a programming point of view that you can still uh, use it perfectly using the old driver. But of course you cannot make use of the new features that have recently been added. So then the compatible value will specify the name of the current version and as a fallback, the older version. Uh, this was good for devices that evolved slowly. An example I give, give here is uh, the additional serial port on a PC. It started with the 8250, then Later, they got a faster version, and then you got a f version with the FIFO. Basically, you can treat the, the last one as uh, an older version, but you cannot use the new features. I put there that's a bad example because the DT bindings for serial ports uh, use really separate compatible values for all those three versions, which means that they don't specify uh, the compatible version for the older generation as a uh, fallback but I guess you get the idea of what I try to say here. Um, this scheme is also suitable for external components that you have on your board. So if you add a, a, a wireless LAN controller on your board and you can specify exactly this is this version and it may be compatible to the previous generation released by the 
contactless LAN uh, vendor. However, for SOCs, for devices present on the SOC itself, it's uh, a bit different. Uh, so we have really fast evolution and a multitude of new SOCs. So these days, if you want to build SOC, it's more or less like Leho or you're running kconfig to configure the kernel. You can add lots of blocks to the system, reuse some blocks here, modify them a little bit. Well, there you have a new SOC and you have to support all of them and specifying a compatible value for the current version and then as a fallback, the older version can become difficult because you don't always know anymore which one is the newer version and what's derived from what and is this SOC that's released later or perhaps that was designed earlier and it contains older version and then some other one contains uh, a version of an IP core from the previous generation, I have no idea why. Uh, they reuse something, make some small changes, but it's not necessarily reflected in the, f in the first revision of the data sheet. And so, yeah, that it becomes really messy. Um, one alternative way of handling this is to put uh, Epson version inside the device. For example, uh, could be a, a version register that you can read or what Sci-5 is doing for uh, RISC-5. Uh, uh, IP cores is to uh, have a ver version number stored in the compatible value. Uh, my per uh, personal favorite would be that they could just store the, the SHA-1 of the, the <laughs> Git repository that hosts the VHDL code for the IP core in the, in the version in a version register and then the driver could just read out the version register and then we don't need compatible values at all anymore. But uh, yeah. In the real world, unfortunately, it doesn't go like that. So either we have to come up with compatible values ourselves, or well, the integer version numbers is they're tied to the HDL repository, so it's at least better. But uh, reality on most SOCs is, is different. So now I'm go now I'm going to talk about what we did for the Vanessa's ARM SOCs. Uh, we decided to always specify an SOC specific uh, compatible value first. So that's, that's one that encodes the part number of the SOC here. The first one is uh, for the system controller on the RCAR M2W SOC, which has part number R8A7791. Yeah, I know all of them by heart, but probably the audio doesn't do that. Or another example is a, a watchdog for some other RCAR H3 SOC. And we do that even if we know that if we think that there are no differences. So we can anticipate for unknown differences that are discovered later. Second, we usually have a family specific compatible value as well. Like this is for the serial port on our car generation two SOC, which has multiple members like H2, M2, W, E2. In some cases, we also have a generic compatible value uh, we try to avoid using that. Uh, the ones that are present are usually either there because they are or there of because of legacy reasons. Like we started with skiff Rensas, comma skiff for serial ports a long time ago, or we use the generic one if there's a version register present in the IP core, which is sometimes the case. Like in the, for the video signal processors um, on the Rensas uh, Arcor SOCs, there is a version register, so we decided not to use the SOC specific uh, compatible value there. So all three of these types of compatible values have to be documented in the DT bindings under documentation, device tree, bindings, subsystem, whatever. And the advantage of that is that the check patch will check if you add a device tree to your uh, kernel that you only specify compatible values that are actually documented. Then the device tree source for a device has to advertise all of the above that are uh, applicable. So for the a serial port, for example, on the R8A7791, it has, needs to have Renesas, comma, R8, uh, that, no, that one used a different order, Renesas, comma, skiff, R8A7791, and the one here, and the generic one. And then the driver will match against the least specific one that will do the job. Which is usually if all the SOCs in the same 
in the Oracle again, two family end up to be, have the same IP uh, versions of the IP cores, then we can just match against this one and don't have to care about that one. But if there ever we ever discover a difference there or there's an errata, then we can handle that. So how many compatible values do we have? So I had never actually done that uh, counting before. So in Linux version 5.3, we document 743 SOC-specific compatible values for RenSS uh, ARM SOCs. So you have to take into account that there are, we have about 30 different SOCs that are supported. Of course, we have less family-specific ones and generic ones. Looking at actual DTS files describing SOCs and boards in the kernel, we have slightly less values that are actually used. And looking at drivers that match against SOC compatible value, uh, uh, match against compatible values, we have as many as these. Um, yeah, so this one looks a bit high, but the reason for that is that once uh, a new SOC family comes out, like uh, we got uh, RCAR H3, which was the first member of the RCAR get generation three family, that we started uh, matching against the uh, SOC specific ones. And then later when new family members were announced, we start introduced the family specific compatible value. And from that time on, the newer DTSs started using, uh, the, the newer DTSs still at SOC specific ones, and of course family specific ones, but then the driver all matched against the family specific one. The driver has to keep on matching on the SOC specific one for the first member of the family because of uh, stable DT API, because if people want to run uh, an old device tree blob on a new kernel, then things still has to work. Now you can start to wonder if it's worth doing all this and having so many compatible values. And of course, if we introduce support for a new SOC, we have to update all the bindings, uh, things like that. Usually we don't have to update the drivers if there are no differences, but sometimes, okay. But personally, I think it is. Uh, so the reasons we have different, we have SOC specific compatible values. For some components, it's very obvious. Like uh, if there's a new SOC, it definitely has a new clock generator and it has different power domains, and it has a different pin controller, so you cannot do without that. But over the past few years, I won't go into detail with this list, but there are about eight cases where we initially had assumed that the IP core was exactly the same as in the previous generation, or it was exactly the same in all the SOCs of the same family. And then later it turned out that one of those assumptions was not true. So, yeah, if we wouldn't have added the SOC specific compatible values, then we had to uh, refrain to SOC device match or other ways to find out what exact SOC we were running on. So I think it's worth doing that, especially if you consider that there are about 23 family specific values for Archer Gen 3. So it means that about 25% of the IP cores on a SOC have unexpected differences. So I think that makes it worth doing it and later having to refrain to special solutions. So that was the hardware description part. Now let's get to the drivers. So on a variety of SOCs in the same family or in different family from the same vendor, so you have lots of similar devices. They are uh, the same or similar with some small features. There could be some bugs, some versions, variants may not support all features that should be or there could be some other limitations. Um, how to handle that in drivers? There are various solutions for that. Uh, 
you can check the compatible value. We have family compatible as a C-specific one. You can use uh, machine type, family, revision, serial number, wildcards of all of those to match it. In some special cases, you may want to match on a device address. If uh, you have multiple instances of the same IP core in an SOC, and it turns out that one of them has some specific limitation, then you may have to look at the device address. I'm not aware of any of these we ever had to address in a Renesas SOC. So the solutions I offer there are first to match on the compatible value. And if that doesn't work, use the SOC device match call. And so you can match on any of the other things. So the different cases you want to handle, first of one is the variant specific. Uh, so on, if on one specific SOC it behaves differently or it has additional features, you can match on the compatible value. Uh, an example of that is just that uh, the new version has more features or perhaps it has less features, that all can also happen. In some cases there are actually issues with the uh, integration of IP cores on the SOC. So the same IP core is reused, but due to some issue, it behaves differently on the new SOC. Uh, in that case, you can match on the device compatible value, or if it's only a case for early revisions of the SOC, you may want to check uh, the revision of the SOC. An example of that is that if you have a broken DMA on, uh, on some device in an early revision of the SOC. Uh, this is one case I mentioned before, that if one instance on the SOC is affected, uh, you probably have to look at the device base address which you get from uh, the rect property. You perhaps use SOC device much too. Uh, you could add a DT property, but it's probably not such a good idea. Uh, yes, yeah, you want to avoid adding properties and usually you only discover that uh, after the fact. An example of that is that it's an, int an interrupt is not working on some specific instance because they they miswired it. Uh, uh, the fourth case is uh, board-specific uh, issues. Uh, fortunately, in the device tree source, you also have a compatible value for the board, not just for the SOC. Uh, an example of the case we had there to consider was uh, on several of the ARCA uh, gener second generation development boards from Renesas. Uh, the boards are very similar, and they all have uh, two uh, regulators for uh, uh, providing different uh, voltages on the on the board, and uh, it turned out that uh, all those regulators they had an interrupt line. They were all tied together, shared interrupt to the SOC. Nice. Except it turns out that if you cold boot the board, that most of the regulators assert the interrupt like in "I'm ready, I have enough voltage on my voltage lines." So as soon as the first driver for the first regulator get probed, it enables, it requests the interrupt, enables the interrupt, and you get the interrupt storm because the second regulator, which is still not driven by a driver, keeps the line asserted. So for that, we needed a regulator quirk, which checks the compatible value of the board and tries to shut up the, those two regulators as soon as possible before that uh, a driver probes them. So how can you match against the device in your driver? Uh, each driver in the new device framework provides uh, a list of IDs that of devices that are supported by the driver. In the case of uh, device tree, it's the OF match table, which is an array of uh, compatible values. A second way which is more specialized is through the various OF declare macros. Um, these are mostly used for clocks, timers, and interrupt controllers, all of these core things that you want to have running as soon as possible in your kernel. Um, a disadvantage of using this way compared to the platform driver approach is that uh, if those clocks, timers, or interrupt controllers have dependencies of other clocks or power domains or other interrupts, that you have a problem. So 
the ARM kick interrupt on uh, interrupt controller on most Ronesas uh, SOCs is actually part of a power domain and it has a, a clock. So if you want to handle that correctly, then basically the clock controller should and the power domain controller should be running before Linux starts using interrupts, which is really early in the system. Another advantage of this OF declare method is that it does obviously doesn't support uh, deferred probable if one of the dependencies is there. In a normal platform driver, the driver can return from his probe routine minus E probe defer, and then the system will try to reprobe it later when the, and hopefully the dependencies are met by the driver or the early things that uh, way is not available. There is a way to mix both method one and two. Uh, for clock drivers, is the clock OF declare driver macro, which basically provides a way to have er one critical part of uh, your clock driver ready early, and that will be called again when normal platform drivers are probed to initialize the rest of your clocks. In some specialized ways, you may want to just find a specific uh, device or loop over all devices, things like that from uh, from a subsys init call or something like that, but usually that's not the case. And then we have the devil does all SOC device match, which I suggest to only use as a last resort if anything else fails. So how are these things to be used? A very naive way to check from your driver if you're running on some specific instantiation of a device is to call OF device is compatible and check it there. It's not a super cheap operation, not super expensive either, but uh, you don't want to sprinkle this all over your driver code uh, because that makes it quite uh, unmaintainable. Similar with SOC device match, so this condition would, uh, would first check does my device match this or does it match that? Uh, and then do something special. That's not the proper way to use those APIs. Especially if you want to call that multiple times in your driver, it doesn't make sense to, to call this a uh, thousand times at different places in your driver. Uh, it's, uh, the same I heard about people who try to call these from interrupt handlers. Uh, and uh, yeah, and spreading all these calls around, it makes your driver not really scalable, not maintainable. It's better to handle all of this just from the probe uh, routine of your driver. So an example how you could handle it well is from the Archive Generation 3 clock driver. So from the init routine, you call SOC device match with a pointer to the table. And this table contains entries for all the specific, all the SOCs with their revisions and then some flags that indicate what issue they have or what should be taken into account. Uh, due to space constraints, I only list one item here, but you can have multiple there. And uh, you store these flags in the .data field, which is very similar to what you have for most other uh, device ID structures that are used for probing uh, PCI devices or open firmware devices. And then inside your probe routine, you can just call SOC device match. If you get something, you can get the flags here. Later, in your driver, you can check the bits in this variable. So you only have to call SOC device match once. Another example is, uh, a combination of uh, matching against normal OF device IDs from your platform driver and using SOC device match with uh, device attributes. This is taken from the video in driver from Archer Gen 2 and Gen 3. So the platform device probe function can call OF device match get data. And then it will get the data field here, which is in this case the address of a structure that describes various features of that instance. Again, it's an array, so you can put multiple entries there and have handle all the various supported differing IP cores of the same type. 
Now, in this example, you want to treat Arca H3 ES 1.x special. So you have a SOC device attribute entry in this array here, where the data pointer points to a completely different structure that describes the features that are specific to the, the early silicon revision, ES1 revision of the, this SOC. Again, you call SOC device match here with the pointer to the array, which contains, I think, only one entry in this example, because else this would not be a good name. And then if something is found, you just override it. So now you can describe the features of your SOCs either in this array here or in that array there and handle it in a unified way. That also means that everything is nicely in one single place, so you know where to look for special handling. And later, for example, uh, people decide, oh, there are no more users of uh, Arcar H3 ES1. It's very easy to find in the code which parts you want to get rid of. Uh, one other case is uh, you may have uh, different SOC revisions where there are quite some changes made. For example, uh, the newer version may have added some extra devices or they may have removed some other devices. Uh, for Arcar H3 ES2, we solved that by having different uh, DTSs for the two, for boards with revision one, with the ES1 revision or the ES2 revision. And the .dtsi file for the SOC itself, uh, we decided to have two different DTSi files and to avoid duplication, we include the new SOC DTSi into the old one and we add and override nodes and properties where needed. You can also use delete node and delete property to delete nodes and delete properties from the included one. And in the inside the drivers, we use uh, SOC device match to differentiate. So as I said, this is what we use for the Arca H3 ES1 and ES2 SOCs, which both use compatible values that are the same. However, in hindsight, we wouldn't repeat this uh, system. Uh, so when new family members of Arcar Gen 3 showed up, it became clear that uh, Arcar H3 ES2 is really a new SOC and not just a fixed ES1. There are many more differences than compared to other members of the family. So if we would have to do it again, we would use, uh, introduce a new compatible value for the new SOCs, which would hopefully make our life easier. Finally, I talked before about uh, Linus Torvalds complaining about uh, the term in uh, the ARM architecture code support. Um, this is a, a slide I presented at ELC, -E, at ELC uh, in my uh, presentation I mentioned before about device trees. And it shows the evolution of the number of DEF config files for ARM. Uh, you see that there was a sharp rise here. And it was already declining a long time before Linus complained. Because this is about uh, 2010 is somewhere here, I think. But the most important perhaps is that uh, the number was not rising. That was the graph until 2014. So now I was wondering what has happened since then. It's a very interesting graph just shifts to the left, and the number of dev config files seems to be really stable since uh, version 3.14. So at least from that point of view, uh, that uh, Linux run has definitely helped. What other impact had it? So this is about the point where Linux started complaining. You see that device trees were already used on ARM32 before. And not much has changed here. Well, it changed, but the slope of the, the graph is, is the same. And then the other graph shows uh, ARM64, which was uh, started uh, a bit later. 
Now, what was the consequence of adding device tree? Of course, removing board files. You see here that the number of board files have, the number of lines in board files has decreased a lot. At the same time, number of lines in DTS files has risen sharply. And very interesting that uh, the rise in DTS lines is not that large. So I would have expected it to be much more, so which probably just means that DTS is a more compact way to represent devices than uh, board files. And of course, it also doesn't take into account what's happening on the driver's SOC, because lots of platform support code is actually being moved from our ARM Mac something to driver's SOC. OK, so that was it from my side, with some mandatory thanks and acknowledgments. And if there are questions, please fire, and I will fire the mic. So you were mentioning this as all of a Linux story. Um, device is actually um, hardware specific, right? Do you get any input from other DT users? So be it like BSDs or um, bootloaders? You know? uh, from, for the Renaissance SOCs, we're not aware of anyone else using the device trees. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, from o OS's point of view. I'm, I'm going to get back to you, but later. So I'm not aware of anyone running BSD or anything using uh, mm. for the U-boot parts, yeah, so Marek is volunteering. Yeah, in he's in sync with us, so uh, he's happy, I think. Uh, yeah, Wolfram? Also not for Renesis, but for I2C, I once, once got contacted, I think, from BSD developers how to handle a binding across different OS versions. But this was once in all these years. Yeah, I know for, for, for PS3 that even people try to run BSD on the PS3 and they just used the device tree that was provided for mm -hmm. Linux with it. But the number of uses there was really, really small. No more questions? Oh, I have a question. So, uh, <coughs> Well, so seeing how uh, you are all moving to device tree, uh, sure. parsing the device tree adds quite a bit of overhead and uh, makes the kernel size grow. So you cannot fit the kernel into very small embedded devices anymore. While with platform data, you could do that. And you can even like do some sort of link time optimization with platform data and throw away a lot of stuff which you know you don't need. Is there something like that for device tree? How do you solve this sort of extra bloat problem? Yeah, the link time optimization is indeed an, uh, a good example. Huh? <coughs> because that's something you cannot do with device tree because you have references to all parts of it. Uh, I know, I think that was discussed in Prague, that there were people who are using some more condensed form of the device tree as well. And they wanted to use it in bootloaders where you basically convert the device tree into some small structs and then pass that, but yeah. But kernel size, yes, it's unfortunately, it's, it's growing, yeah? About 40K per release for this, a similar device. So in 25 years, that's a lot, huh? <laughs> so I have a question. Uh, this came up actually in the Tracy Microconference at Linux Plumbers. Uh, they want to extend the uh, kernel command line because the kernel command line is very limited in size and uh, they brought up using the device tree and the first set of patches that use the device tree to try to extend the kernel command line. It was um, knacked to because they said we're not a configuration. It shouldn't be used for configuration, but someone else said that's, that train or that ship has already sailed. What's your thoughts on using the device tree for like extending the kernel ma command line for much well, that's definitely uh, something you could do. Uh, you don't have to restrict device tree to systems that really boot from device tree. You could uh, have device tree overlays on systems that don't use device tree to add 
additional devices and things like that. Uh, Do you have think there's a problem with using it for that purpose? But for a command line, yeah. You could also just pass a, a pointer to the to the new command line blob on the old command line. Yeah. Like, like you used to pass uh, MTD parameters and things like that. Well, we need a, we need a way of parsing whatever. We, it's like it's going to be actually extended, which ah, the parsing. New it's going to be parsing as well. So mm -hmm. we actually are creating a new language. So right now they're doing a new language, like a, uh, I forgot what it was, like SKC. Some, uh, it was, it wasn't extended command line. I can't remember what the S stood for, but some system command line. Or, or command ah, so it's not restricted to ASCII, like uh, the current command line. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's, no it's, but it's a bunch of fields. You're basically going to create some more complex operations to say, okay, you've got this operation with a bunch of fields attached to it, and this operation mm. with a bunch of fields yeah. attached to it. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I think using device tree for that is, yeah. is overkill. If it's just a field value, a list of field value pairs, but for de describing devices uh, on an external I2C bus or something like that, I think it's, it's useful. But uh, since the device tree people don't want to specify policies in the device tree, would it make sense to have something like a config tree, which could specify policies or maybe the kernel command line in, in a more descriptive way? So that's actually what Basami Hiramatsu came up with the extended thing that could actually do just that. So we are actually creating, re basically doing another type of device tree for configuration options. Mm. Yeah, maybe you should ask the device tree maintainers. But it seems, uh, yeah, they're indeed very quiet when it's more about policy questions, things like that. I have a few unanswered questions about that as well. Um, yeah, especially when, when it comes to the driver side, I would like to mention that it's uh, also good to not only uh, focus on the device tree, but because we have an abstraction of this, which is a firmware node, I think. So, because uh, for some yes. properties, they might be present not only in device tree, but also in ACPI. It's also, uh, as a software yeah. developer, that's good to yeah. keep in mind, and we have an abstraction for that in Linux, so if you use that, you cover for yeah. now, device tree, ACPI, and whatever. Comes yeah, I didn't tree. mention any matching based on firmware like ACPI or uh, UEFI, uh, whatever you have. But indeed, these days, uh, if you want to check if a device has some properties, you can call the, if it's for device tree, you can uh, call the OF functions. For ACPI, you have ACPI functions. But now we have the unified API, which is device get property. And that even works for platform devices if your board code. A board code can register properties with a device, and then you can obtain them with a device get something, and it will work on device tree, ACPI, and on traditional platform devices. Um, looking at that graph, ARM64, <coughs> the line for ARM64 uh, DTS was much smaller than the 32. Is that just because it's newer, or do you think it has to do other, other things with the platform? It's mainly because it's newer. Okay. But actually, if even the slope is lower than. Okay. The, yeah. Because I know they've done things to try and standardize things more. I don't know, with ARM64, I guess. I'm running out of time. Yeah, so we, um, on ARM64, there's also platforms that use ACPI, so you won't have all of the platforms there. So that's going to account for some of those. And um, yes, whilst there have been standardization efforts, uh, most of that also applies to 32-bit, at least with the, uh, the V7 parts. So I'm not sure that would contribute to all that much difference, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but speaking about uh, <coughs> having similarities, so many SOC vendors, when they're moving to ARM64, they're reusing the same IP cores as before. So I don't think that uh, things will change. And when they're moving to RISC-V, perhaps they will do that <laughs> as well. And <laughs> You've run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Or they may de de decide to reuse something from old Intel PCs in, uh, in RISC-V, who knows. Okay, thank you very much.